take the effort to actually draw all this out when I did my solution. I just took a piece of paper and scribbled the critical things on there and drew some lines and said, oh, that's correct, that's correct, and total it up, and then I was done. I didn't even take the time to give the full artistic effect like I am here on the board. But I chose, just for argument's sake, I chose for my standard path the most common path on that table, the inner city path. So I chose, and you, you know, I chose the inner city path as my, as my common path. And so these are inner city paths. These broad chalk lines are inner city paths. As I spec in the instructions, we're allowed to do these on a 20 minute cycle. So there's actually 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 paths because I've got them on 20 minute headways. So there's three paths an hour. Each path is a 20-minute window, 20-minute wide window, going down the track, uh, consuming track resources, mapping out a band, just like in the graphics on the previous slides, literally mapping out a band of track consumption in time and space going down the diagram. And I've centered these paths on the hour, so 8, 820, 849, 920, 940, 10. 1020, 1040, 11, bang, 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 down the lines. I've got a, a new path starting every 20 minutes in the time cycle of the inner city so that it reaches the other end of the line an hour later. Now, I'm going to draw the actual real trains on top of these paths and see what the consumption is. Now, obviously, these times don't match on the hour exactly, so I gave a little wiggle room and I said in the instructions, well, if the trains within five minutes of the boundary of the path were good, it's okay. So this first train is five minutes out from eight o'clock, it's 8.05, but that's, it's a 20 minute wide band, so it's still five minutes within the boundary of the path. So that first train is, is not centered on the path, but it's still within the bounds of the path, so it's a one for one. The first train uses one path, we're done. It doesn't violate, it doesn't climb out of that path, it doesn't use any more resources. It's a one-for-one one match. Now the second train is clearly not going to do that. The second train is a lot slower. The second train is going to start at 825, which is kind of right about here. It's still within the five-minute band of the path at the beginning, but it clearly is not going to follow. It's going to do a long sweeping thing like this, and it's going to do like this. 11, yeah, 11, oh, just making sure I get the 8.25 to 11.05. It's going to do like this. And this is MX07. And clearly that is consuming a lot more paths. It's consuming 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we're done because we're, we're ending right here. So 6. Six paths that are conflicted by this train. But as we'll see here in a minute, we, we get a little bit back because we can run another train parallel to this. And so it's not exactly six paths for that one train because we can still share some of that territory. So the next train down is the, the 113, 925, right about here. Again, we're within the five minute boundary, but we've got a five minute stop in the middle. So what's going to happen? is it's going to do like this. It's going to go 11 to right about there. And it's going to come halfway. And then it's going to do like this, shoop, in a five minute stop. And then it's going to keep on going and kind of jig jag. Let me get my, get my ruler back on here correctly. Right about there, kind of like that. My art isn't perfect, but it's close enough. So it's going to kind of do like that. And so it's, 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 it's going to use this path, but this path we've already kind of used up a little bit, so we don't double count that. So it's one, two, three, four. And the tricky bit is it ends at 1130. And that, this is where the standard path thing kind of messes you up, because I just told you five minutes is our, is our buffer zone. That violates the five minute buffer zone. So even though it's only a little bit, it still is sucking up another path because it violated that other path. It's on the boundary, but it is violating it. I mean, it, you know, it is what it is. 
So it's a limitation. We've already seen the limitation of this standard path concept because suddenly we're like, wait a minute, it's only a little bit, but no, it counts. It counts. You, can't, you just can't change the rules in the middle of the game. So this is going to suck up. It's going to violate further down into this next path, even though it just touches it. It's just touching it, but it's still doing it. It's still violating that path. And you keep on going down in the same manner. And, you, and when we're all done, you look to see what paths have not been touched. Those are the free ones. Those are the leftovers. That's my unused capacity. Everything else that's been touched is part of your consumption. And if we look at it that way, and I go forward here, here's the solution slide. Uh, so these are kind of what paths those trains cross individually when looked at only by themselves. But you'll see that some of them, some of them we kind of, well, we kind of double up and we share a little bit of capacity. We don't quite use them all individually. So after you've done all this, you basically find that there are two paths way down here at the bottom that don't get touched. There are two paths down here at the bottom that are still left open. So we have two left over that don't, don't get used, but 14 are touched. 14 are actually used. And so we have an 88 87.5% utilization, 87.5% consumption based on the standard path logic. And of course, the failure of that logic is that there were lots of places where it's just, I mean, it's literally just by the touching it. It's just the boundary. It's so close that you say, well, that doesn't really count. We should be able to kind of jiggle a little bit more out of this. Uh, but the standard path mentality doesn't allow for that. It doesn't work that way. So. Um, Questions? Oh, and, and did anyone try a different standard path in your city? Or did you all jump straight to inner city? I mean, it's kind of, you say, oh, it's the most common one. I'll use that one. But if, you'll find that if you used a different path, you know, if you use this slow train as your standard path, you probably end up with uh, pretty much 100% utilization. Because what will happen is uh, the, the slow train, all these paths will cross and, and suck up all the capacity. And you don't get, uh, particularly down here, if you had a slow train as your standard path, then these two guys are going to hit all of the paths and consume them all. And I'm, I haven't, I did not honestly actually have not tried the solution with these as a standard path. So I'm not, actually don't know what the answer would be if I used one of those as a standard path. I don't know. You know, but, uh, but you get the idea of how to do that. Questions? So that kind of has a limitation. So we got to address that. We got to do something, and that's really where we're headed. We're trying to figure out how can we do something better than this. So we need to think a little bit about, well, what are we really doing? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is, as we've kind of already learned in the previous lectures, this isn't really the way a train moves. This vision of this broad highlighter stroke across the string line is, is not actually the way the train occupies the track. And we want to discuss that in more detail. We talk, again, we're going to talk about signals and the blocking signals system. And it is, in fact, that the train path is, of course, actually a series of blocks. Because the block, the left, if we look at this, if this is, uh, if this is distance, to keep in the same framework of our, my, I've already in my conversation. If that's distance and this is time, well, the left and right side of the rectangles are, that's a fixed, that's a given, because that's the physical location of the block. We're done with that. And then the entrance and the exit of the block is going to be a fixed thing based on when the train enters. But we're going to have a disjunction. It's going to be a stair step pattern. It's not going to be. It's not going to be like this. It's going to be a stair step where we occupy a block, we release the block. We occupy a block, we release the block. And so looking at it that way, looking at it that way, then we have to say, well, when does the train occupy the block and when does it release the block? Well, we already had this conversation a week ago or two weeks ago where we said, well, you know, actually the train takes time to slow down. And there's a safety boundary. We have to worry about giving the train advance notice of when the block is occupied. And so really, we have to reserve the block for the train in advance of when the train gets there. Because if we don't reserve the block before the train gets there, we have a safety violation. Because if this block is not reserved, if this block is left open for somebody else to occupy, 
while this train is still rolling into the block, there's no way for the train to stop in time in front of that block. So we know there's a minimum amount of time and distance the train needs to come to a stop. So in effect, the train possesses the block before it occupies the block. There's possession and there's occupation. Occupation is the train is physically in the block. Possession is the block is reserved for the train. And you, if any of you have any inter information technology background, there is a similar concept in database technology. You have read and write privileges. And if you ever take an exam for a really high-end database system like Oracle or um, DB2, IBM DB2, you will be stunned to learn that there's like 15 or 20 different levels of locking privilege for an information record in a database. Because there's, there's locking the record with the right to write to the record. There's locking the record with the right to read the record and prohibiting someone else from writing to the record but not you writing to the record. And then there's locking the record with the intent to edit the record in the future, but you're not going to do it right now. You want to do it later. And there's all these different levels of locking. Because if you imagine you're the airlines database for United Airlines, and you've got 1,000 different people all trying to reserve the same seat next to the aisle over the wing next to the bathroom in the middle of the uh, transcontinental trip on July 21st, uh, you could potentially have hundreds of people all looking at that same seat at the same time, considering whether they want to reserve it or buy it or not, blah, blah, blah. And you've got to have all these levels of locking to give a traffic cop to decide who's next in line to select that seat for the journey. And so we have the same thing with blocks on the railway signaling system. We have to have a logical system of reservations that we know who is next in line to reserve, to possess that block. And at the most basic level, clearly, the train that's already moving, that's rolling, is very obviously the one that possesses that block once it's within the signal limits of that block. So we have to calculate using our train dynamics, using our runtime calculation. We have to figure out, for a train running down a path, when does the block possession start? When does the block occupation start? And when does the train release the block? When does the train release the block? Now, I purposely left a little bit of a nudge of blue right down here, because when you get really technical, especially with a long train, once you get to talk, talk about a long train, there is the front of the train leaving the block and occupying the next block, and the back of the train still sitting in the block, still in in two places, you know, it's kind of like Four Corners, New Mexico. Anybody ever been to Four Corners? Probably not. You've been to the United States, the Southwest? All right. So Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, and uh, Arizona, they all meet at right angles. And there is a, it's all, it's on Indian territory. It's actually an Indian reservation. So it's a tourist trap. It's, it, you know, you go there and buy souvenirs and park your car and, buy European priced sodas and stuff like that. And, and, but the, they actually have a monument, a big concrete thing with a big bronze medallion in the middle. And you can stand there in the middle and put one foot in one state and one foot in another state and just kind of do like this and just kind of you know, be a three-year-old kid again and try being in all the states at once. But it's the same thing here. We got a train with one foot in one block and one foot in the other block. And while the train is rolling, until the rear of that train exits the prior block, it is actually occupying two blocks at the same time. And so, this will, yes? Sorry, Ursa. Uh, this can happen only in your destination, so when one train leaves the block, or it cannot happen also It could happen, yeah, it sure could happen. Yeah, you, you, you're doing this, and you pull a coupler, and you go to emergency, and the train stops. That's You would, you would clearly not be a great idea to design your system so that this happened on a regular basis. However, but stations, you know, Central Station, Copenhagen Central Station, I'm sure you get the great big overnight sleeper train that's going to stop running in December. It's like 15 cars long. 
you know, I'm sure when it pulls into a platform, it might foul, it, the end of the train might actually foul one of the lead tracks to one of the other platforms. So that would be an example of a train. And that would require that each block would have the highest capacity, like a capacity of the previous one. Right, right. And in, and in terminal tracks, you're just not going to do that. When you've got terminal trackage, you have lots of little short blocks because you, you're, you're, you've got crossovers and sidings and platforms and all kinds of crazy stuff. And you're going to have times with really long express trains where you're going to foul, you're going to block, conflict more than one terminal, one, more than one platform at the same time. And that's unavoidable, uh, especially if you want to have the flexibility to handle both short suburban trains and long international trains. Um, and and in North America, and possibly even here in Europe, you might, you know, you might have the long distance freight train from Norway coming through and then going in, you know, passing through. I know this would happen in <coughs> stations in Germany. We have a big long freight train and it's passing through the passenger station. And it, uh, something happens, it gets stopped at a signal, but the train is so long that it actually, the tail of it blocks a couple of tail tracks or something like that. That, that could happen <coughs> easily. And that, that would be unavoidable and, quote, intentional in the sense that they had been planned for and part of the understanding of the design that that, that was just going to have to happen from time to time. So yeah, there could be a reason where you just, it is a daily occurrence, a necessary daily occurrence. But again, primarily in terminal areas where the blocks are really small. We're talking blocks that are like 100 meters you know, because they're so short that they're just, they're just controlling access to platforms and things like that. So this becomes really critical because we got to figure out what these block occupations are so that we can figure out what this looks like so we can do this at a higher level of detail. So once again, we're doing this by hand, but clearly the commercial software products would just take this data table and just go and just whip up all the answers and just throw it at you really fast. We just want to have a conceptual understanding of how they're doing it. So using the spreadsheet technique that we had from a couple lectures ago, what is that block occupation for, say, this train running at 45 kilometers an hour? And uh, what would it be? When, when would the train have to reserve the block? When does it possess the block? When does it physically enter the block? And when does it exit the block? And so take a few minutes to calculate that. Take a few minutes to figure out what that would be. <laughs>